Luke chapter 13. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 18. As you're turning there, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. Um, this is the verse that talks about the mustard seed. We all know it. Um, Julie recently bought some necklaces for the girls that have a mustard seed in them. And uh, she was showing it to Aiden the other day. And Aiden said, Mom, there's no mustard seed in it. And she had to point to the little dots. I mean, tiny little dot. They're only about a millimeter. Because he couldn't see it just when he first looked at it. So these are tiny. All right, starting with verse 18. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, that he shall answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught us, you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at a table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Amen. All right. Batteries weren't working, so I'll just speak louder. Probably safer for everybody. Uh, We are in Acts. We're going to continue in Acts uh, probably till Easter, Resurrection Day, and... uh, Probably change gears a little bit and focus on something different for a brief season. Uh, But we're continuing Acts today, looking at chapter 16. This is really something that, again, if you're taking notes, we have right on the top. It's the second journey. We already saw the first journey in Acts chapter 13 and 14. The first official missionary journey. There's other journeys and other things that happen, but these are the ones recorded in the book of Acts. And the ones that the Holy Spirit has for us, for Christians for all time. And so this is the second one we're continuing. We saw at the end of chapter 15 that Paul says to Barnabas, hey, let's go visit the churches. We're going to go, you know, let's go see how they are. It's probably been about a year or two since they planted the churches. If you know your map, if you you need one, let us know uh, now or later. And it has the four different official journeys. Again, there's more evangelism, more mission work besides these, but these are kind of the predominant ones just following one stream of the Apostle Paul. Because we see that Barnabas and Paul have a disagreement, and they don't like John Mark. Right? He's kind of a loser. I don't want to take him. He's dead weight. He abandoned us before. He's going to abandon us again. Paul says no. Barnabas says yes. Well, he takes John Mark. They go on their own missionary journey, and they still go do the task, but we follow Paul. And, of course, he takes Silas with him. He meets Timothy, and then he links up with Luke. So now we got at least four guys, maybe more, but we know there's at least four So looking at this, we're in the middle of it. We're in the throes of Europe. We saw last week that the gospel has now officially reached Europe. The full gospel of Christ that, yes, there's pictures and shadows and things, and we even look at creation, and there's a creator and these things, but now the full 100% gospel that Jesus is this Messiah, this Messiah who died and resurrected, this perfect, flawless Messiah, He is the one who was born in Bethlehem of Judea. He is the one who lived. He was a carpenter and he was a teacher for a few years and then was crucified. Because remember Abraham and Noah and David, they all pictured a Messiah that was to come. Lot, right? Melchizedek, all these, right? Eve and Adam. 
everybody else beforehand who are people of faith. We see this in the book of Hebrews that these people are people of faith. And ultimately, that's what it is. You're always, it's always a faith. It's always trusting God, trusting his provision and not our own. But they looked forward. Now we look back because nobody was there at the tomb. Even Peter himself didn't see Jesus physically rise from the grave. Everybody, every single person takes it by faith. But people live by faith all the time, don't they? Right? Whether it's their car or their chair or the medicine they're taking from their doctor or, you know, that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. People live by faith. We all do all day long. Different levels of faith, different things that we put our faith in. Sometimes it's just in ourselves, but nevertheless, it's everywhere. Speaking of things that are everywhere... There's invisible things that transmit information. You didn't know that, did you? You probably didn't, actually. But it's everywhere, right? And it's, and it's, it's something we can't even see, kind of like faith or like love. Other things that are both emotions, but even like deeper than our cognitive brain. These things, these entities, as it were, are invisible. And they're everywhere. And you probably think I'm talking about spirits, right? Just talking about radio frequency, right? Your cell phone, Wi-Fi. No, I'm just kidding. That too, though it's invisible. But I'm also, you know, tongue in cheek. There is also spiritual forces everywhere, which we will see in this passage. Yes, there's RF. RF it's not spiritual. It's physical stuff. But we can't see it, right? You can't see air. You can't see love. There's so many things we cannot see. Even how you know your phone works, right? Wi-Fi, the electricity. I don't know, right? All day long, we're just like, this is kind of a magical world. We don't look at it like that, but often that's really what it is. So we're going to be looking at these powers and really kind of the thrust of this passage and from the rest of chapter, from now until chapter 16 in particular, is Christ over the Roman gods. Because this is a Roman colony. We see this, and this is, this is where we live now. We are in Rome now in a Roman colony now, as it were. We're no longer in Jerusalem. And we'll see this in next chapter, chapter 17, when Paul is in the Areopagus in Athens. Because we see the differences of how evangelism and missions and how we are to live and really even engage with the culture. It's not 1920 or 1820 or even 1950. Most people now don't even know anything about the Bible. They don't know the name Jesus, you say Adam and Eve or Noah or Abraham or something, and they have no clue. Even in our own county, we're very much in a Roman post-Christian time. Yes, there's still churches everywhere, and yes, there's still many people who love the Lord and many people who say they do, but by their actions and deeds deny him. At the end of the day, we are not in Jerusalem where everybody accepts God and this and this and this. We're, we are in Rome. And that's what Paul, I'm getting ahead of myself with chapter 17, it's one of my, probably my favorite chapter of Acts, but Paul is there, and we'll see that in greater detail. But now this is Luke writing and telling us what is going on. They're establishing the church of Philippi, and this is all Rome, right? This is all the Roman pantheon of gods, the plenary gods that are not at all like the true God, Yahweh. So if you don't mind standing, we're going to read chapter 16, 16 through 24. We'll pray and we'll dig into the text. Luke writes, by the Spirit, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this many days, and Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, it's a great passage, I love that, and I, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews! And they're disrupting our city. And they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. 
The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off of them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this text again. Thank you for revealing yourself. You did not have to forfeit your own privacy. You did not have to save us through Christ. You did not have to do give us revelation. But you did. Help us to praise you for it. God, thank you for your kindness in so many different ways. Thank you for your grace that we don't earn our salvation. There's nothing we can do that's good enough to earn your favor. Be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> so the first point, the spirits know, verse 16 through 18. And the second point, the people know, 19 through 24. Spirits know, the people know. We'll unpack what that means and look at how these things really matter for what's going on in the text and how it works for us today. A bit of background. We see the language here, spiritual. We see this, this is very, very uh, common in one sense, what we see in the word all the way back to Genesis 1, right? The spirit of God, the same pneumos where we get pneumonia, right? Breathing, this whole thing. It, it, it's breath, it's movement, carried along by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. This thing, ship being carried by wind, same thing. So there's, there's these, God uses these physical elements to explain and tell us of spiritual realities. James tells us in James 2, the spirit, the body without the spirit's dead, right? Spirit of God, we see this, this there's, there's, there's so much, I mean, you can probably do a whole study on this, honestly, but there's so much here, and we come to this passage that is, you know, last passage, they're with Lydia, they're down by the river, you know, hey, preach Christ, and oh, oh, that's that's who the Messiah is, okay, because she's already a God worshiper, you know, how that really works, some people say, no, she's not really a Christian, some people say she is, okay, doesn't really matter, ultimately, she's now baptized, now she's walking with the Lord, right, she's baptized in Christian faith, and there we are, nothing really supernatural about that, and just as a matter of fact, Luke keeps writing, and all of a sudden there's this spiritual reality, now, again, our world is very, very, and even the church most of the time, we're all very sanitized, right? We get the Purell just like slathered in Clorox over everything, and it's all just dead. We just think God's up there, and there might be a devil somewhere, and that's it. That is wrong. <laughs> that is abundantly wrong. And if you believe that, you should change your belief, because that's not what the Scripture says at all. And there's nowhere that it says, well, all these demons are gone now. They all died, or something like that. But Satan himself and his entities and powers and principalities has done a great job here in America to tell us sophisticated Americans that, you know, that's just, you know, that's just fake. Forgetting those same people will believe in ghosts and aliens and all sorts of other weird things, but not demonic powers from Satan himself. They're the same things, they're just different names. Masquerading as an angel of light, we see that, right? Satan's the father of lies. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, and so on. The spirit of the prince of the power of the air. On and on and on. So, just like as a matter of fact, they're here, verse 16. They're going to the place of prayer. Likely the same place where they're down by the river. Again, there might be a synagogue, there might not be. But they're there, Lydia's now worshiping, and Lydia's rich, right? We saw that she's wealthy, not crazy wealthy, but wealthy. She's got a house here, probably in Thyatira, where she's from. <coughs> and servants, and maybe her sister or brother doesn't mention a husband. And she's a believer. And this is a pinnacle. This is where they basically plant the church at Philippi, which is the, the most friendly, most kind letter that Paul writes is the church uh, uh, at Philippi, right? Partners in the gospel. They're very generous and gracious. This is planting out of Lydia's house. We see that at the end of this chapter. And as a matter of fact, you know, a slave girl had a spirit of divination, brought her out as much fortune telling. Wait, what? Like, all of a sudden, you the spirit of divination. Now, sometimes we see people, and you know, they're kind of the health wealth preachers, and they're like, oh yeah, 
the spirit of depression. He's the spirit of poverty. You know, you're the spirit. You know, you believe in this thing, and therefore that's why you're poor. But if you give me money, then you'll be rich. Like that's kind of that, their shtick. Makes a whole lot of sense, right? Of course. But that's what they think. And they'll use spirit or the demon of, of anger. And it's just like, ah, you really mean a demon? Like an actual physical, or are you just like using that as like a phrase, as a synonym for just having a problem with anger? Demon of lust, right? Like, I don't know. I've never asked them really. I guess I could next time I get an opportunity. But there's so much kind of like foggy craziness that this isn't that though, right? She doesn't just have the spirit of divination because that's not a natural tendency. Fortune telling and actually making money at it is hard to do, right? You're not the tarot cards. They're like the strip mall. He's very popular in California. I don't know if I've seen him here in Kentucky, probably somewhere. You know, with the lady and she has the little thing of the person, the palm reading. That's not what's going on. This is actual person because if you, if I were to tell, you know, say it's me doing it, and I tell the Wilsons, hey, this is going to happen next month, and it happens, they're going to be like, oh, I'm going to go back to that guy. Right? And we're going to pay more money. Tell me, tell me more. What do I need to do? What's, what's the next thing that's going to happen in my life? So there's some level of knowledge that this young girl has. Likely, uh, you know, probably 12, 14, doesn't really say, but it says slave girl. It's not the word for woman, so she's, you know, very young. It's possible that her owners are her parents. Some people, commentators, were thinking that, and just basically abusing their daughter because she's demonically possessed. <laughs> like, that's kind of a big deal. And as supposed to searching out and caring for your daughter, you use her for financial gain. Something we are seeing more and more of lately in our world. So atrocious, so weak. Not necessarily demon possession, but certainly other acts that are heinous and evil. The spirit of divination, though, it's... I like a better translation. Uh, I don't know, somebody else might have it, but... I want to ask the children first, who likes Ninjago? I know some people do. Keith does, Caroline, Joanna, Bennett, Gwen, yeah. Amelia kind of does the one finger. Anybody else like Ninjago? Yeah. You know what it is, it's okay. It's a Lego cartoon. So it's Legos, but they're cartoons, and they have, of course, Legos toys. So it's been out for a while, very popular, kind of goofy cartoon, but they're ninja, they're going, they're ninja going. I don't know, that's why it's Ninjago. Anyway, of course, there's a bad guy named Garmadon, right? Or Garbanzo Bean, as some people say it in our house. But there's also other guys. Who are the other guys? Ben, who are the other bad guys? There's skeleton guys. And the, and the other ones? Harumi. What are they? Harumi. Harumi? What are the snakes, though? What are the snakes called? Serpentine. Serpentine. Here's what was that, Joanna? Future Dove. Future Dove. Yeah, there's all sorts of little plays on words there. It's pretty funny. Anyway, there's the, the bad guys, or the serpentine, for us old folks who don't know what I'm talking about. Everybody north of 12. Uh, <laughs> that is the same lingo here in the Greek. It's the spirit serpent. It's actually Python in the actual Greek. So this daughter, this girl, has a snake spirit. Now, there's all sorts of imagery and all sorts of things that go into the Bible with that. But she's got a serpentine spirit. This all the way goes back to Genesis 3, right? The devil himself appears as a serpent. Serpents, by and large, right? the serpent of old we see in Revelation, the dragon, the great beast, all these things, they're bad, they're evil, they're gross. Even snakes yourself, you're like, Ugh. I don't know, I'm talking about BBS and having snakes for BBS. I missed that last day, but... That's on that. That's July. We'll see. Maybe I'll get over my phobia. But nevertheless, this girl has a spirit of the snake. That's a really, that's the best translation. And it's this fortune telling knowledge. So it's a big deal. This is where we get into the, to the language a little bit. You can kind of see a deeper meaning. It says, verse 17, though, she followed Paul crying out, screeching, some translation said. These men are servants of the Most High God. How did her voice sound? I don't know. Like gurgling and screeching and not just proclaiming like, hey, do you know Jesus? Like handing out a little track. Like she's yet like following them and annoying them. 
And not just that, but proclaiming the way of salvation. I mean, in one sense, that's convicting to me, because this demonic entity is telling the truth. And how often am I not doing that? How often do I fail, even in my own life, to not proclaim that? Or you? How often do we stumble and think, ah, I missed that opportunity? And yet this girl's screeching. She doesn't care who it says. And this is a demon, right? This isn't a friendly angel. It's a snake spirit. Python. So we can see here that the spiritual realm is being seen once again. We see this oftentimes in the gospel, right? You are the son of God, the demon tells Jesus. Remember the guy's cutting himself. He's there in the tombs. He's breaking the chains apart. No one can bind him. And then he, Jesus heals him. Well, similarly here, although Paul does it after a while, and because he's greatly annoyed, <laughs> which is pretty... <laughs> I mean, I can't not laugh at that. I don't know, like... Like, I don't know, maybe he was using her, or like, maybe he was a benefit at one point, and then it just became annoying. Like, it'd be annoying if you guys, somebody stood up and started yelling and talking about my past, and like, yeah, you're from California, and you went to this school, and you're a Christian, and it's like, okay, yeah, let's talk after, sit down. Like, we're having a service here, like, we're, you know, we're doing this thing. Or at work, or anywhere else, like, during a movie, like, you don't want, even if it's true, that's unhelpful. And so Paul, greatly annoyed, rebukes this demon. But notice this tension, and this is a good example of many tensions where, you know, God's in control, but we're responsible. Here's another one that's, he's talking to the girl, right? It's a girl who's doing this. She kept doing this, verse 18. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you. Notice that? So the girl's doing it, but there's still a spirit in her. So there's still this point. We talked about this this morning in... Well, I talk about Mormonism briefly in the, the denominations class. Not that it's another denomination, but that's what LDS uh, tries to style themselves as. And one thing that Joseph Smith, who founded Mormonism 200 years ago or so, he, his family was already into magic. They were already into these certain things. When you open the door for tarot cards or Ouija boards or whatever, even little stuff, you're inviting those things in. And when you invite them in, they come in. So how this girl got these powers, as it were, I don't know. But the thing that's fascinating is that the spirits even know. Right? And that's our first point. The spirits know that Jesus is the Christ. The question is, do you know that Jesus is the Christ? Do you know that Jesus is the way of salvation? It's not being good, right? It's not going to church or giving 10 or 20 percent or memorizing scripture. It's rather casting your burdens on God, on Christ, because why? He hates you? No, because he cares for you, right? Cast your burden on me because I care for you. But this is one of many, many instances of the spiritual realm, some like 400 different times in the Bible. Huge, huge, huge. Probably should do a study on it, like I said. I think we will. That sounds good. So, a couple things real quick, and we'll get to this. But one point, we can't just ignore this. Okay? So if you're a Christian, you can't just ignore it. You can't just say, ah, I don't really know, this is weird. I don't like this. I don't like this. Not good. Secondly, we are warned repeatedly from the Word not to worship it. Right? We also don't even think like, ah, oh, that's kind of interesting though. That's a little, I like that's a little, that person has a little power. They've got some fortune telling, or maybe it's not even that extreme, but still, like, the demonic imagery and these other things. I mean, Halloween, even from when I was a kid to now, is, like, demonic to the hill, right? Like, it's, it's changed and morphed, and I think a lot of people just are willingly ignorant to the fact that you have, like, you know, corpses and dead things hanging around. It's like, this isn't neutral, y'all. I'm not saying you guys are doing that, but it's, 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 it's not neutral. We'll just say that. And we shouldn't even worship it. Jeremiah 26, 25, 6 tells us that. Jeremiah 25, 6, 2 Kings 17, 38. Also, Deuteronomy 12, 30. Deuteronomy's loaded with that, so that's 
That's the one. There's also Deuteronomy 18 as well. But we know that we have no other gods before God. This is the first commandment. And if you want more study, Isaiah 19, 1 through 4 also. Isaiah 19, 1 through 4. So we have to just talk about it. At least we have to at least try to understand it and recognize what's going on here. Can't ignore it. Don't even pretend to like dance around the edge of maybe worshiping it or even engaging with it. Don't do it. Bad news. Don't do it. But what's interesting, like I said a moment ago, that a lot of people will say, oh, that demonic parrot, they don't, they don't exist. But those same people will believe in ghosts, they'll believe in spiritual helpers, ascended masters, some people will call it. All these things of dwelling, there's these outside forces, you'll hear it in this lingo, whether it's some Hollywood actor or some other person talking or some Christian who used to dabble in these things, it is incredibly real. It's very real. Just because you haven't experienced it, and praise God you haven't, if you haven't, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. There's, I mean, it's, it's countless, the amount of examples. I mean, there's things like ghost hunters, right? You've probably seen the TV show on you know, sci-fi, Discovery Plus, all those things. But they all come from a secular worldview, don't they? They come from a worldview that if there's a God, he doesn't really engage with us, whatever. There's these ghosts, and there's these things, and we're going to hunt them down. And maybe I'll be a ghost one day, or I'll get to hunt my grandchildren when I'm dead. Like, what better lie to tell people than... <laughs> Debbie looks at her granddaughters, I love it. <laughs> uh, sorry. What better lie to tell people that, oh, you're just going to die, you'll just be a ghost, you'll just float around. You'll just get to do this and that, and just kind of be a spirit. Personally, and I don't have lots to back this up, but personally, the things that people do experience, which there are those times that people do experience things, I believe, and even if they look like your great-grandma, is a demon. My personal belief, that one's extra-biblical. I, 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 that's what I think. I mean, there's, if, you're, if you're taking a biblical worldview and say God is sovereign, God is king, but there's this level of agency that these fallen angels... And demons, which are two different things, two different things. Well, get, we got to do the study. All right, I'm convinced. I'll we'll do it. But these things that go through, and there's, and we see it so much in the Bible, especially in the Gospels. But then we hear about it in our culture. And again, we could just ignore it. Ah, that person's weird. That person's, eh, they're just making it up. They can't all be making it up, right? And again, there's Christians who have come to Christ who have crazy stories that don't comport with naturalism, quote-unquote. So, they're not real ghosts, it's a lie, but they're likely some sort of demonic power. But there's other things, even still, I'll move on after this, but, I don't know if you, have you guys seen these instances where like five-year-old, six-year-old, and they tell a story about how they used to live in like a lighthouse in like the 19th century, or they were married to like a princess and from France. Have you guys ever seen these? Like kids talking about past lives that they shouldn't know anything about? Yeah, Debbie's saying yes, yes, yes. I've seen a few of them here and there just come across for random reasons. The weirdest stories, and like as a matter of fact, like I saw one recently. A little boy was like, oh yeah, I, I flew in World War One and I died in a plane crash. He has like five-year-old telling his mom this, as a matter of fact, and you're like, Wait, what? You know, and like telling details that this kid shouldn't know would be impossible for him or her to know. And again, I think that's a level of some sort of demonic either influence or, or knowledge. Again, it's weird, but the Bible's weird, and that's okay. It doesn't mean it's bad, it means it's real, because <laughs> reality's weird. Anyway, that's all modern examples of what we see happening. Things that happen in our real world that as Christians, we should look at and say, ah, we shouldn't just write it off and walk away. We should at least have a biblical worldview to say, ah, I've seen this. I think that's what's going on here. So that's one way to apply this. To see that this happens, it's real. These demons, these fallen angels, they didn't go anywhere. They're just either by a different name or we just don't pay attention. So at least be aware of them. Not seek them out and don't ignore them. James 2 again tells us demons believe in Christ as well, don't they? But what do they also do? Shudder. They're scared. Despite it being a snake serpent, a spirit, a python, that is controlling this girl, as it were, 
Nevertheless, they bow the knee to Christ, which then leads me to say, do we walk and bow the knee to Christ? Do we repent and turn to him? Because the demons don't, right? They, they, they believe it, they know it, and they hate it. Right? The difference is knowing it. We can't just know it. We have to do something about it, which is submission unto Christ. Not to me, not to the church, but to Jesus alone. So the spirits know. Turn over to Deuteronomy, fifth book there in the Bibles, all the way back. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18. Verse 10. There shall be not, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. Okay, check. We got that one. I think we can do that one. That's good. Don't kill your kids and burn them to Molech or Baal. Good. Let's not do that. Anyone who practices divination, right, what this girl's doing, or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium, not like bigger than small and smaller than large, that's like, you know, a diviner, right? medium, or as Starbucks calls it, a ronde, sorry, Starbucks. Anyway, or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. This is talking about the people that Israel is going to drive out because they're practicing demon worship, worshiping the dead, divining, charming sorcerers, necromancy, which is necro, they're, they're, you're convening with demons. They're all individually different actions. Verse 13, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations, which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. It goes on and speaks about a prophet. In fact, look at verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word of the Lord does not come to pass or come, is not true, that word, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, presumptuously you need not be afraid of him. Other passages, it's so severe, it says, kill him. You prophesy something and it doesn't come to pass. This is serious. Again, this is sometimes we look at this as modern people and we think, man, that's a little harsh. Why should we? Because God made us. I don't know. But we shouldn't do it. So don't do it. Right? Pretty straightforward. But Paul, again, here, we don't know what happens to the girl or her parents or owners, whatever. Back over to Acts. Sorry, flip back over to that. But the point is, God knows better than we do. And that's another thing we could just pull out from this. We think, well, that might be good. It might be helpful. I think, I mean, I'm myself. I own me. No, you don't. Right? Nobody owns themselves. Either you're a slave of Christ or you're a slave of Satan, slave of sin, slave of, slave of something, not Christ. But that's kind of the modern thing today. We have people who we're all, well, that's just, it's my body. I can do what I want. I can do whatever I want. It's my, I can do this. I can sleep around. I can do whatever. No. It's not true. You didn't make yourself. God made you. Right? And he craves and desires and calls you out to repent and walk with him. And when we do that, we still fall. We slip and face plant in the muck and the horse manure and mire of nonsense. But then we don't lay there and say, I'm clean. I'm fine. No, we look back up to him and say, forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me. Wash me again. Walk with me, please. That's the difference between the Christian and everybody else. The Christian doesn't pretend. We don't pretend that we're sinless. That's nonsense. We're not talking about sinlessness. We're talking about relationship and walking in integrity and fidelity with Christ himself. Not saying we don't have sin. We do have sin. What does John say? If anyone says he doesn't have sin, he's a liar and makes God a liar. I don't make God a liar. We're all sinners. Everybody in here. Everybody's ever lived, Right? That's not the trick. That's not the point. Oh, we're not sinners, or we're saying that. That's not what we're saying. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what faithful pastors, preachers, theologians have said ever. Rather, we acknowledge our sin. Because the world says, I'm fine. I'm good. I don't need no carpenter from first century. I don't need some God telling me what to do. 
I'm still a pretty good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. You've lied, you've cheated, you've stolen. Christ says you've looked with lust, you've already committed adultery, you've been angry, you've already murdered. We're all under condemnation. But praise be to God who gives us Christ simply by faith. Right? That's it. That's how you get this. And that's what Paul and Silas, Luke, and Timothy are doing. To the second point, we see that these people know. The people know. These things vary a little bit, and how these things really work in each situation is a little different. Again, remember, acts is acts. It's action. It's telling of something that happens. It's not something that's going to happen next time, or we need it to happen. You don't speak in tongues, you're not saved, or something like that. No, that's not what we're saying. You can't heal somebody, you're not saved. No, that's not what it says. You don't cast out demons. <clears throat> we need to take a class on demon casting. No, I just saw that recently. Again, I don't search this stuff out, people. I really don't. It just, it just comes to me. But like, you don't need to take a cap. Just, just, just don't do it. And I guess if you have that situation, just know that Christ is King and proclaiming Christ's name. Right? Get a little weirder for a second. I'm not saying you should seek this out. And if it happens, it happens. Great. But you don't need to take class. We don't need to, you know, go through a four-part series on exorcisms. It's not what we're doing. This is just explaining what happened. So, Paul casts her out. Verse 19 then. Look at it with me. When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and disrupting our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept their practice. Follow the money. That's just one thing you can pull from the second point. Very, very, very applicable in the last couple of years, especially. Money, as the scripture says, is the root of all kinds of evil, not all evil, or is evil. Money's not evil. Money's neutral. What you do with money is the trick. That's the difference. But so often, and if your eyes are open, and I hope they are, we've seen some disparities in the last couple of years, have we not? With this thing being wicked and terrible, which really isn't that bad, and these things being so great and righteous, and they're actually terrible and wicked. And just the lie after lie after lie from almost every talking head known to man. Anybody with a platform, it's like now that's their job to just lie all day long. At least that's my opinion. But if you follow the money and you see, oh, this show is sponsored by that company, that's weird. And this show is promoting that company's goods. Interesting. Seems like a conflict of interest, maybe. Maybe they don't actually care about my health at all. Possibility, right? How much disinformation, so-called, has been suppressed and hidden and the loss of money or the risk of losing money, people are now like, well, you need to shut up. Oh, you're lying. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, blah, blah, blah. Once they lost their money, these owners act just like how every other wicked human acts who's not submitted to Christ. They lose their gain and they say, now there's vengeance. You messed up my business. I'm going to get you. How they drag them off and do their thing, I don't know. I mean... Is there a law against casting out demons? Like, like you ruined my business, so we're going to take you to court. Like, strange, weird. And then Paul and Silas get beat up with rods, right? Not just yelled at, but beat up and then thrown in prison. They tell them to tear their garments off of them, not the magistrates, but Paul and Silas. And beat them with rods, 22 says. And then 23 says, they inflicted many blows upon them, threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And has this not happened somewhat in our modern time? Canada, pastors doing just this normal thing, getting arrested, arresting their church buildings, putting up little fences around that so Christians can't go. Even some churches went and met in fields out in the open and helicopters are flying down, you know, Black Hawk Down style and arresting these pastors and these church leaders. This is in Canada. This happened in 2020, 2021. And there's still 
trying to shove these things and force their agenda. It's not enough that people who are wrong want to be wrought, seen as right, but then they want people who are opposing them to be silenced. Make no mistake, the truth never fears examination. The Bible is never, ever afraid of being examined, never being afraid of being looked at, never being afraid of cross-examined, looking at history. It, it's because it's God's word, because it's true. But when a cult leader or a group, somebody on TV, they don't want to be examined. They don't want you to talk. They don't want you to ask counter questions. Make no mistake that that person's probably, most certainly lying. I'd say certainly lying, not probably. And ultimately the whole point here is not just to ridicule this person or this system or look at these people doing these dumb things but ultimately to know that Jesus is better, right? Christ is king, and always pointing to him, though he's not here, other than I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, showing the power of Christ, not in Paul's name, right? Not in Peter's name, not in James, but Jesus' name. That this Jesus is king, advocating, what does it say? Advocating for us Romans not to accept or practice. So Paul and Silas and the other guys are telling them, no, no, your Roman stuff is going to lead to hell. It's going to lead to death. Don't do it. Jesus, another king, it says in another place, this is a Jesus, advocating for another king, that is Jesus. This is one of the main things that got Jesus crucified. Right? Because he is the king of the Jews. But Herod was supposed to be king of the Jews. That was his title. Not this carpenter who doesn't have any money. This guy doesn't have an army. Not an army we can see. Right? Jesus reminds his hearers that he could bring down legions of angels to do his bidding if he wants. But he didn't. Why didn't he? Because of his great love towards us, even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's why. Because had he done that, redemption would not have happened. And therefore, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Jesus did this. Ladies, he is the perfect husband. Okay? Men, he is the one who leads his bride and washes her always with the word. And children, likewise. You see your parents, you see your friends, oh yeah, I'm going to look up to them. And then they fail, they sin against you. There's anger, there's bitterness, maybe divorce or something worse. Your parents are not your example. You don't look to your mom or dad or your grandparents. Ultimately, you look to Christ. Not just as your example, but as your Savior. <clears throat> and not just children, but everyone. So if you're heavy laden, do you have sin? I know that you do. Give it to Christ. Don't burden your own sin. Don't bear it. He doesn't want you to bear it. He doesn't want you to have to take it. You don't need to take it. When you cast your burden on him, he cares for you. That's why he does it. We don't deserve it. No one's saying we deserve it. Concerns about the culture, worry about finances, inflation, <clears throat> give it to Christ. Scared of what people will think? What people will say? Give it to Christ. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, as I've already said. And I will give you work to do. I will castigate you for your sin. I will make you feel poor and stupid. Is that what he says? I will give you rest. The thrust of this passage, the whole book, really, is Jesus' power over the gods of Rome. His power over the gods of Rome. And likewise, not just Rome now, but the Rome of today. Whether it's D.C., Frankfurt, the media, Hollywood, doesn't matter. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is God to the glory. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. If you can't say amen... Repent and believe the gospel. Turn to Christ. Let's pray. Father,
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this example, this instance of, of, of supernatural craziness that our modern eyes and ears are often very confused at. Or we just want to ignore or, or, or look the other way. Help us to not dwell on these things as, as some fascination, but know about them. But more than that, know that Jesus is the King of Kings. It's not just a slogan. He has triumphed over the grave, and not just the grave, but also all the principalities and powers. They know it. They know it. We see it in the scripture post-resurrection. They know it, and yet so often we forget it. Forgive us for forgetting, Lord. Be with us as we walk through our week. Help us to remember to cling to Christ, to look to Christ, to give it to Christ. In his name I pray.